I like to continue the Dhamma talk on Metta. Metta is such a vast, uh, profound uh, subject. So we have to explore various aspects of uh, various aspects of uh, metta. For four uh, Brahma Viharas, four sublime states, four what we call uh, uh, immeasurable, illimitable, which in Pali is called Appamanya. As I mentioned yesterday, it is immeasurable. Now, let us take each of them in turn and try to understand a little more uh, each of them. When we cultivate uh, loving friendliness or metta, we really don't know uh, beings. We know only very few ourselves, our you know, closest, dearest ones, and uh, our maybe our adversaries, and others are a huge amount of multitude of beings whom who we don't know. I think 99% of beings are just uh, being. Uh, like dots in the space without face. There are at least six billion human beings and there may be several trillions of other beings. Animals, insects, fish and uh, beings, visible beings, invisible beings and uh, deities, gods, devas and brahmas and uh, uh, what you call demons uh, and so forth. And we don't know them. This is the beauty of the practice of loving friendliness. We share this friendly feeling with beings whom we don't know. If we share these thoughts, this loving feeling with the beings whom we know, then uh, there is the limit. But we share these thoughts with beings whom even we don't know. Countless beings all over the universe. It is very much like imagination. We cultivate these thoughts in our mind. And we also wish at the same time all kind of noble, wonderful, peaceful, happy state of mind for all other beings without even knowing them. And uh, this uh, is the state, this is why it is called altruistic, a sublime uh, state. If we become uh, if we show our loving um, friendliness towards somebody whom we know very well and because of out of gratitude and so forth and so on, it is not a big deal. It is very simple, ordinary things. Anybody can do that. But to do this practice without knowing beings is not very easy, very difficult. It is very much like, um, suppose there is a woman who likes children. And this woman, uh, after a lot of wishes and attempts, and she becomes pregnant. When she knows that she is pregnant, since she is so uh, earnestly wishing, willing to have a baby, as soon as she knows that she became pregnant, she and her husband both become very glad, very happy. And she would do a lot of things to protect the embryo. 
Buddha said, when you practice uh, loving friendliness, you protect yourself. When you protect yourself, you protect others. Say in this case, the mother, I mean intended mother, who is just pregnant, she wants to protect herself. I don't have to explain these things to women who have been mothers. Uh, if they have been taking certain drugs, prior to their pregnancy, they would take drugs without too much, uh, uh, paying too much attention. But as soon as they knew that they are pregnant, they read the label. They consult the doctor and ask uh, what, are, what is the side effect of this particular medicine. Uh, even if it is very important medicine, she would consult a doctor in order to protect herself. Uh, if she is a smoker, if she is going to be a benevolent good mother, she would do anything to stop her smoking, to protect herself. If she is a, a habitual drinker, she would do anything to stop drinking, to protect herself. If she spent a lot of hours unnecessarily doing various um, activities, she would reduce them. She would select the food she eats. She won't eat any junk. She wants to protect herself. She needs a lot of food now because now she is going to feed two instead of one herself and what she treasures within herself. She would listen to good talks, good music, and uh, have good conversations uh, to protect herself. While she is protecting herself, she protects the uh, embryo. Why, 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 uh, how can she protect, how uh, she protect the embryo? Because, as you know, it is a part of her life, part of her body now. She is 100% responsible for entire life of that little embryo. There is no other source of, uh, uh, you know, life source for the embryo. Only the mother's food, mother's thinking, mother's medicine, mother's behavior, mother's blood, everything that mother takes is shared by this embryo. So she knows that. So in order to protect that embryo, she would protect herself. So in, in, inversely, while trying to protect the baby, the in, embryo, she gets protection. So Buddha said similarly, even though we don't know other beings, when we practice the thought of uh, uh, loving, uh, friendly thought, we get protection. We get protection. In order to protect ourselves, we cultivate these thoughts. Protect ourselves from uh, hatred. Protect ourselves from polluting our mind. Protect ourselves from lack of sleep. Protect ourselves from uh, ill health. Protect ourselves from uh, being uh, nasty. Protect ourselves from uh, other, other beings, other persons, other individuals. Uh, uh, negative attitude towards us, we like to have some people's good attitude towards us. Protect ourselves from, uh, to, uh, ourselves from uh, um, having a negative attitude towards them because we, love, we like to be loved by others. So when we cultivate the thought of uh, uh, loving, uh, friendly thought, we protect ourselves. When we try to protect ourselves, we protect others. As I mentioned at the very beginning of our retreat, I said uh, uh, we uh, protect uh, others by observing the precepts. Out of compassion, out of uh, loving, out of respect, out of loving friendship, uh, uh, friendliness, uh, we 
uh, observe certain principles, not to violate others' privacy, not to violate others, uh, uh, others' uh, feelings, uh, not to destroy lives, not to uh, hurt others and so forth by abstaining from slander, slanderous talk, gossips and uh, insulting talks and lying and so forth. We abstain from these things. When we abstain from them, we protect others. All these are action in uh, what you call uh, loving friendliness in action. And that goes far beyond our imagination. There is no limit to that. Although we don't know other beings, our attitude helps us, protects us, as well as others. So, when the baby, when the, uh, the um, embryo uh, slowly, gradually turns, uh, develops and uh, becomes um, sort of fetus after eight weeks and then uh, mother begins to feel the presence of the uh, um, uh, fetus and uh, after about four or five months, mother feels the baby's t turnings, baby's sleeping time and all. When she experiences all these things, her love for the baby increases. And love for the baby, love for the fetus increases. And the father's love for the fetus increases. They don't know what sort of baby they are going to deliver. Mother does not know whether this uh, fetus is going to be a male or female or a healthy one or unhealthy one or a stupid one, intelligent one or <laughs> a useful one, a useless one. <laughs> you see? Uh, social manners or problem. <laughs> Nobody knows. But all she and he know is that there is a fetus growing and they do everything to protect that and their love keeps increasing. Just like we cultivate living thoughts uh, towards all living beings without knowing them. Sometimes people say, this is an unconditional love. That is a completely wrong term. It is not unconditional. It is immeasurable. The term immeasurable, boundless is better and meaningful term rather than unconditional. The, all the Brahma Viharas are not unconditional. Why are they not unconditional? Buddha said, uh, uh, Etang abhisankatang abhisanchetaitang. Yankinchi avisankatang avisanchetaitan sabbantang niroddhamma tadanichyan sabbantang niroddhamma That which is, uh, that means uh, these are mentally created. This thought is mentally created. Anything mentally created is conditioned, not unconditioned. And that which is mentally created also is impermanent. That which is mentally created also can be unsatisfactory. Also it is without self. That which has these, 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 these three characteristics, no matter how altruistic it is, it is not unconditional. They are bound to change. They are created mentally and therefore they are not. This is the Buddha's own explanation. Therefore, please never say that this these four sublime states are unconditional. People always talk about unconditional love. Nobody can create unconditional love. It is always conditioned. Conditioned by the, at least these three things. Impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and selflessness. I will talk more about it when I show the direct connection between this and uh, 
mindfulness. <coughs> so, mother and father both develop this uh, uh, loving, friendly thought towards the, their fetus. Similarly, we must cultivate this loving, friendly thoughts towards all beings without knowing anything about them, without taking any factor into consideration, any factor in their life. They may be saints, they may be robbers, they may be wicked, they may be mean, they may be hypocrites, they may be uh, you know, saints, it doesn't matter to us. As long as they are breathing living beings, whether human, animal, insect, whatever. This is the thought, mind you, this is the thought. And we cultivate this thought in our own mind. Just like the parents cultivate these thoughts in their own mind with regard to the fetus. They have no power of uh, making the fetus anything other than what it is, except taking care of themselves, having these wonderful thoughts towards the fetus. When the baby is born after nine months or nine and a half months or ten months or whatever time it takes, uh, maybe nine months, right? Okay. <laughs> Whatever, whenever the baby is born and uh, baby uh, lying on, the, on its back and all of a sudden baby cries, shows some discomfort uh, because a mosquito bite or um, change of temperature or because of hunger or uh, the bed is not comfortable or uh, you know, whatever the clothes you put on the baby are not comfortable or something. For some tiny little thing, uh, baby cries. When baby cries, oh, your heart melts. Oh, my poor darling, baby cries. Let me run. <laughs> you run to the baby. You don't say anything, you immediately. You know, some mothers, when they are alone, at home, if they are, say, double story building or something, if the baby in the bedroom, now in this country I have seen, uh, while the mother is cooking, uh, there is a device, uh, some kind of um, baby, baby monitor. monitor, baby monitor, that's the word, <laughs> baby monitors. You see, they are so concerned about the baby's welfare. When baby cries in her baby's bedroom, mother can hear from the kitchen. Mother stops everything and rushes to the baby to take care of the baby. See how much concern they have, how much compassion they have. That moment mother's heart melts and she runs, rushes to the baby. And every day, for many months, many years, this is a tremendous 24-hour job of a mother, benevolent mother. And she always is concerned about, I mean parents both, uh, mostly mother because when the babies are very young, they are uh, so close to the mother because from the stomach, from the, what do you call, womb, uh, uh, baby recognizes the mother. So uh, only mother's voice, mother's touch, mother's hug, mother's kiss, baby recognizes better than anybody else's. So, so always baby goes to the mother. So when uh, something happens, uh, mother immediately reacts to protect the baby out of compassion. This is an example of compassion. First one is, is an example or simile of uh, uh, loving friendliness. Similarly, somebody who practices compassion, real true compassion, 
we'll see be suffering beings at homes in their village in their city in their country traveling in other country or hearing in the newspapers so you know watching the media they hear or they see and they witness suffering beings it is overwhelming enormous amount of suffering going on and one who practices compassion seeing this suffering they feel very desperately compassionate they are compassionate their compassion is so overwhelming of course they are they know their capacity is limited and yet compassion is very great and they don't know these people in the case of the mother at least mother knows the baby but uh, uh, suffering that uh, someone who practices uh, compassion sees uh, is from uh, individuals of all type all uh, classes or group or ethnic groups or um, uh, sex uh, or all kind of beings suffering everywhere so the heart melts so we must see the difference between loving friendship friendliness and compassion loving friendliness we cultivate without knowing beings only we know that there are beings compassion cultivates while knowing the beings when the suffering arises when we witness the suffering then compassion arises us in us for loving friendship friendliness uh, there doesn't have to be any suffering to be witnessed but for cultivating compassion there has to be suffering beings and suffering should be seen and then third is appreciative joy in this case of uh, mother and baby or parents and baby when the baby shows um, its uh, growth uh, improvement and uh, turning uh, crawling and uh, uh, then uh, uh, every movement every um, moment of growth when they witness they rejoice they appreciate it when the baby uh, tries to uh, walk uh, they help the baby to walk uh, they they do all sort of thing to appreciate to promote whatever improvement the baby makes uh, and when uh, uh, baby grows into a boy or girl and uh, you know may play with other children when parents watch their own baby their own child and seeing that child is doing well with other children they are very happy they appreciate it and coming home from school bringing good grades they are very happy and growing them to be very beautiful teenage boys or girls parents are very happy and uh, when they Uh, meet their lovers you know they go together stay with them and so forth parents are very happy to see them in a in a very healthy situation and they never become jealous sometimes girl can become more beautiful than the mother i don't think mother should mothers would be jealous of that beautiful daughter similarly son may be very handsome big boy even uh, stronger and uh, more handsome looking than the father i don't think father would become jealous of his own son or mother would become jealous of her son both parents benevolent parents are very proud very highly they talk very highly of their children this is 
what we call appreciative joy. They appreciate their children's growth, development. Similarly, when we cultivate appreciative joy, I think I mentioned this earlier, uh, when we see others' success, material, spiritual, uh, success, physical success, their skills, their performances and so forth, which um, sometimes may be competitive with ours, sometimes uh, which we don't have in ourselves, and yet when we cultivate this thought of uh, appreciative joy, we appreciate that. There is a very um, uh, retold story. I told this story many times. Uh, I think this this uh, is another mo good moment to tell that story. You have heard the story of Magga. Magga, not those Maggas so Magju. <laughs> this my my Magga is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Pali, uh, coming from Pali uh, literature. There was a man, young man called Magha, M-A-G-H-A, Magha. He went with uh, his friends to uh, see a sort of a festival, like big carnival. And uh, the festival w took place in a very um, unclean, uh, muddy uh, place. So this young man uh, cleaned a small spot for him to stand. And he was watching the festival or carnival and uh, next moment another bully, big hefty fellow, came and pushed this fellow out of his place and took his seat. He just, you know, cleaned up a small spot. Everybody was standing on mud and dirty places. This fellow was a very neat, decent person. He cleaned that place and stood it, stood on it to watch the festival. And this bully came and pushed him from his place and took that place. He did not fight back. He did not fight back. He took me, yeah, let me clean another spot for myself. Let him have it. So he cleaned another spot. And when he was standing there and watching, another bully came and pushed him from his place and took it, took that place. This young man did not fight. He could easily, could fight, but he did not want to fight. He thought, well, yeah, this place is plenty, large place, a lot of uh, dirty places. Let me clean another dirty place for myself. So he went on cleaning, cleaning. Every place he cleaned, somebody else took it push him out of his place and he took his place. Then he thought, you know, if there were somebody else, what would you do? He would give up or fight back. But what this fellow did was, this is a wonderful thing. People seem to like clean places. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go on cleaning the place for people to stand and watch the game. <laughs> That was his joy, his pleasure. Instead of, you know, watching the festival, enjoying himself, he thought of cleaning the place for people to enjoy the festival. <laughs> and then what happened? When he was doing it, he found few other young people. There are among young people, there are wonderful minded people. Few other young people thought, hey, this is wonderful thing. This guy is doing all by himself. Let us go and help him. They also came and helped. So, towards the end of the festival, he formed a club of youths. Cleaners club. <laughs> <laughs> Cleaners society. Their job was to clean dirty places. Going from place to place. For, for nothing, no, no charge, uh, no reward, no pay, nothing. Just went from place to place, cleaning dirty places. And of course, uh, the end of the story is uh, very, very interesting. 
So these people went from village to village cleaning, uh, building bridges, you know, cleaning dirty wells and uh, uh, gutters and all sort of clean, dirty places they clean. When they went to one village, <coughs> uh, the village headman uh, was uh, frightened. He thought this fellow's village headman was a lazy fellow. Did not want to do anything. He was just taking his salary and sitting in his house. When these fellows went and started doing this work, village became village, village, villagers began to like these people. So village headman got afraid. He thought this fellow is going to take my these fellows are going to take my job. So let me go and make some complaint to the king. So he went to the king and complained. His complaint. Uh, the, the things he complained against these people were that they were robbers, thugs. They came and they came and started stealing things from people and uh, destroying the village. So king sent his uh, police, arrested these people, 33 of them altogether, brought to the king. Then these people, they asked, uh, he asked them, are you guilty or not? He said to your majesty, we are not guilty. How come? Your majesty, come and see what we have done there. This man is lazy. He, does, he doesn't do anything. We came and started cleaning your village. You go and see how many bridges we have built. Ask, do you ask people whether those bridges were there before? How dirty this village was? That is what we have been doing. He was afraid of losing his job. That is why he made this complaint. So king was so pleased with these people and gave him a village to live. They said, no, your majesty, we didn't work for a village to, to get a village to reward. No reward. Our reward is here. We are very happy. We are happy. We rejoice other people's happiness. Rejoice in other people's happiness. That's enough. That is what we need. So they all went on doing that until they died. So, you know, we don't have to do too much to enjoy other people's happiness. We can make others happy by doing very tiny little thing. Saying good morning, good evening, how are you? Smiling when, they, when you see them and so forth. Very simple little things we can do to make others happy and happy ourselves. So anyway, this is appreciative joy. We enjoy <coughs> appreciating others' enjoyment, others' pleasure, others' joy, others' health, others' happiness and so forth, instead of becoming jealous. <laughs> the last of these four is equanimity. In the case of this mother and father, when the boy or girl grew up and they became, uh, you know, independent, they have their own home, they have their own job, they have their own bank account, their own car, uh, you know, they are working on the society, in the society. So, they think, oh, that is very good. They are independent. They don't need our support anymore. That is very good. So they are content. Parents are content. That is equanimity. Now equanimity therefore is not some kind of uh, uh, indifference, negative attitude. Uh, equanimity is a very strong degree of contentment, knowing everything is okay. Everything is going on okay. That is one as aspect of equanimity. The other aspect of equanimity is when uh, uh, we cannot do um, anything for certain dire situation. Situation is so bad. Uh, we have we used our compassion. We used our what do you call uh, loving uh, friendliness uh, 
we use our appreciative joy having used all these three sources we still find there are enormous amount of things to do no human being within human capacity can do all this at that time we become equanimous what else can we do so <clears throat> these are the four states of uh, sublime states if you want to define them uh, uh, separately in practice however <clears throat> in one day all these four sublime states we may practice in one situation perhaps all of them we practice we cannot uh, wait to practice each of them separately today we practice only this tomorrow that and so forth all the four we can practice uh, at any time now these four have been uh, very highly rated highly graded four one time a uh, man uh, visited vendaval ananda uh and asked him to list the the most import one most important thing in the buddha's teaching so when the balanand gave him three most important things one attaining jhanas two attaining enlightenment three practicing these four sublime states you can imagine the the place this four sublime state has in the buddha state and buddha approved it buddha gave 40 uh, 42 let me see 40 actually 45 uh, uh, subjects of meditation in vishuddhi magga you can see 40 subjects and in one sutra buddha has given 45 subjects of meditation i'm sorry no no i'm sorry 42 factors of enlightenment 42 factors of enlightenment <clears throat> we hear seven factors of enlightenment 37 factors of enlightenment but in one place he gave 42 factors of enlightenment in one sutra that is uh, anapana sati sutta in that uh, additional 5 uh, out of first page is 7 i don't know to give lists when we when we give list some people get tired of listening to lists uh, but for those who are interested in lists uh, <laughs> this is the list <laughs> <laughs> some people are interested the list is list is four foundations of mindfulness four kinds of effort then uh, four uh, what do you call uh, uh, it uh, four four uh, steps of uh, accomplishments for four foundations of accomplishments 12 already and then five spiritual powers and five spiritual faculties 22 and then seven factors of enlightenment and noble eightfold path 37 and the other five to make 42 uh four of the other five are these four sublime practices each of them would the rated at the same uh, strength as other 37 factors of enlightenment as i mentioned yesterday <clears throat> for the last run of course last one is anapana sati mindfulness of breathing this is how we get uh, 42 factors as i men- mentioned yesterday the the foundation real true foundation of the entire buddha's teaching is the practice of loving 
friendliness. Everywhere, every tiny little piece of the Buddha's teaching, you can see this everywhere, without any exception. That is why <coughs> Buddha's life was so completely saturated with loving friendliness, oozing out. Wherever Buddha goes, you can see the loving friendliness is coming out of his mind and body. That is why everybody loves the Buddha. Everybody loves the Buddha. There was a monk called Vakkali, you have heard of him, Vakkali. As a layman, uh, he, was, he just wants to see the Buddha. That's all. He did not want to meditate, he didn't care for Dhamma discussion or Dhamma talks or anything. He just wants to see the Buddha. Because he was just an embodiment of love. Everybody, men, women, boys, girls, children, animals, divine beings, non-divine beings, demons, yakas, animals, all loved him, without any exception. This man, as a young man, when he saw the Buddha, immediately he fell in love with the Buddha and he wanted to become his disciple. He wanted to become his disciple not to practice anything, but to follow him wherever he went and stood by his side and admire his beauty, his, you know, pouring out loving, friendly, friendliness. Until one day Buddha said to Vakali, what are you doing? He said, sir, I can't help, I'm sorry I can't help, but I cannot take my eyes away from you. <laughs> then Buddha said, Vakali, don't waste your time. This body is uh, subject to decay, death and uh, growing. Uh, you, this will disappear. You use your mind, very young, healthy, beautiful mind, to do some meditation. So he gave, out of compassion, he gave him advice. <coughs> so, because of this, Buddha's attitude, all his life, he was a workaholic, <laughs> so to say, because he worked on, slept only two hours a day. You know, these days, if somebody slept two hours a day, what would that person be eventually? Mm -hmm. eh? Sick. <laughs> Sick. But Buddha, for, for 45 years, until he died at the age of 80, this was what his, this was his life, working out of utter compassion. Compassion for people who, whom, whom he never knew. <clears throat> so, therefore when you practice uh, loving friendliness, people can see that in you. People, people can feel your loving friendliness. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes, um, I know it from my own experience, I practice loving friendliness, you know, wherever I go, whenever I have time, I practice that. Uh, sometimes when I on uh, buses, people, I hear say, I wonder whether he has the same uh, uh, pleasant uh, mind, in, mind in him as he looks like. You know, I, because I, Use the loving, loving kindness meditation, loving friendliness meditation. I tell you another story. This also is a very true story. One day I was sitting in uh, Gatwick Airport in England, and um, uh, there was a bench, white bench. <coughs> I was sitting, in, you know, cross-legged. Um, and since there wasn't anything to do, I was not interested in looking at people. I was uh, sitting in cross-legged position, you know, four lotus, and then I just, I, I began to feel practicing this loving friendliness. I was practicing it. All of a sudden I felt, I was closing my eyes, all of a sudden I felt uh, somebody 
next to me, sitting next to me. I didn't open my eyes. And next second, <coughs> I felt very uh, soft, uh, tender, tiny, two little hands going around my neck. <laughs> So I opened my eyes, I saw maybe two and a half year old, blue eyed, blonde hair, little girl is around my neck. <laughs> she has put her hands around my neck and hugging me. <laughs> then I saw another woman with a big, you know, bag, one in one hand, another bag in another hand, and her little this little girl's uh, diapers and all mm-hmm. this and her um, boarding pass and so forth. She's going to the plane. <coughs> I heard before that uh, a plane going to Malaga was about to leave and asked everybody to board. And this lady was going to the plane and with this little girl, I saw the, saw the mother and the girl, you know, walking, mother and the girl was came and sat, got onto my seat and uh, hugged me. I have never seen this girl. She was saying something in maybe in Spanish. <coughs> I didn't understand anything. She was kissing me, hugging me. <laughs> and beautiful, I think better than a doll. Beautiful little girl. <laughs> and then mother from there uh, called her. She would not go. <laughs> then mother said, please bless my little girl and uh, let her go. I said in English to her, please go, your mother has a lot of kisses, lot of hugs, lot of toys, lot of sweets. Go, go with your mother. I don't have any of those things. Go. She would not go. So the mother came and uh, with a very nice uh, friendly tone, she said, please. She was, you know, in tears. She wanted to catch the plane. And this is a very unusual episode. And everybody is sitting in the, at the airport looking at me. <laughs> you know, they might have thought that this is my child. <laughs> oh, I know the child. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what they thought. <laughs> but they were all looking at me. <laughs> and I asked this little girl, she wouldn't go. So mother came and very gently, with full of love and compassion, she took her hand out of my neck and asked me to bless this girl. I said, please go. You will be a very good girl. You are a very good girl. Uh, go. She would not go. She was crying and crying. Mother snatched her from me and she was you know, kicking her legs and uh, fr- trying to get loose from the mother and to come to me. She was crying all the time. This is a wonderful uh, um, unforgettable experience in my life. We have never seen, I don't know where this girl came. Probably she might have thought, I am a Santa Claus. (laughs) 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 Because I am wearing, I am wearing this robe. (laughs) One day when I was walking in uh, Germany, in, uh, uh, I think, um, Berlin or Hamburg, I don't remember, a little girl like that, seeing me, I, I remember telling her mother, Mommy, Mommy, see, Weihnachtsmann, Weihnachtsmann. <laughs> Weihnachtsmann means Santa Claus, right? <laughs> because I was wearing my robe on board, uh, covering both shoulders. Perhaps this little, this was in July, <laughs> not even December, I mean, this uh, in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, what do you call, Yatwick Airport incident took place in July or in December. <coughs> but in little children's minds, there is no so much of time concept. They all remember the Santa Claus. Probably she might have thought, I'm a Santa Claus. <coughs> Whatever it is, my mind was uh, very, I, mod- I was very happy. I think since I was practicing this loving kindness, this little girl felt uh, some, you know, children are extremely sensitive. When you are angry, they feel it. 
when you are full of love, compassion, they feel it. I think probably she might have felt something uh, unusually in uh, me at that moment. And I never forget that incident. Sometimes loving kindness, loving friendliness works marvels, wonders, miracles. Uh, sometimes they are not. When I uh, walk uh, on this road every day, I go with, I don't know, like to walk with somebody because I want to go with my thought of, uh, you know, my friendly thought towards all beings and whenever I see somebody I wave. Sometimes dogs, very fierce dogs, come to attack me. Uh, just recently, last week, a dog, big dog, was walking with uh, two two children walking were walking the boy the, walking the dog and from a distance I heard the dog barking he was coming towards me ferocious looking big dog and he, he showing his teeth he was ready to bite me I sent all my last ounce of loving kindness towards this dog <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> but <laughs> I have loving kindness a stick. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> I did not beat him, but I held the stick like this. I carried that every day. Like this. When the dog came near, I held it. He, he was going around and was holding, so he could not get close to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> sometimes, uh, very seldom, uh, it doesn't work. Most of the time, it works. <clears throat> I think all my my friends, my colleagues, and my students here, they all know the, my story of uh, the man living there. <clears throat> I think I told that story many times. Many years ago, since I started walking, whenever I saw somebody, I waved like this. When they were driving, I just waved. This man, <clears throat> when I waved, he frowned at me and, you know, and he spit and he was very upset. I don't know why. But I never gave up. Whenever I saw him, I didn't like that. After about one year, <coughs> he stopped frowning and spitting. And then I felt, oh, it's wonderful. It's work. It's working. So after another year, <coughs> He was driving. Uh, after another year, he lifted one finger. <laughs> <coughs> so I thought, this is wonderful. This loving kindness works quite well. Third year, he lifted two fingers. <laughs> you know? Uh, then after next year, he lifted all the four fingers. <laughs> While driving, he just did like this. <laughs> so one day, when he was driving this way and going that side, turning that way, uh, since he was turning, I did not uh, wave to him. That day, he took his hand out of the steering wheel and stick it out of the window and waved to me. <laughs> After about a year, <clears throat> I saw his pickup truck parked in the forest in summer. And he was smoking. I walked up to him and asked him, is, um, I know where he is, who he is, but just to get him to talk, I asked him, sir, uh, I, no, I simply said, is it, it is a very beautiful day, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, where do you live, by the way? In that trail and under the 
power, power, power line. Ah, don't you think it is dangerous to stay under power lines because uh, there is a lot of radiation? No, I have not uh, been uh, affected by that. When I moved there, I even could not, my, could not lift my fingers. <coughs> then I asked him, why? What happened? Just after my birthday, <coughs> I was driving in a, huge, uh, in a rain, huge tree fell on my, on my car, and that's all I knew. After 13 months, after that, I woke up in the John Hopkins University Hospital. He said, every bone on my body was broken into pieces. And they had put me in a plastic bag and taken to the hospital. Thirteen months later, I recovered. I, I regained my consciousness. Now, <coughs> I am back. When he said, uh, after my birthday, I asked him, uh, when is your birthday, by the way? December 8th. I said, it is just one day after my birthday. Mm-hmm. I said, since then, he is my friend. <laughs> I think one day he came here when I wasn't here and asked uh, where I was. No, I was, wa- I was uh, walking on the road there and he stopped me and he asked me, where's that other monk? I haven't seen him in a long time. I want him to come back. <laughs> <laughs> So, little by little, slowly and surely, <coughs> this works. And therefore, we should be very um, positive, very optimistic in the practice of loving friendliness. It works with everybody. There are many benefits of this practice. Today I don't have time to say the benefits. Now, this is these are very few incidents that we know from our own life. So please um, remember them, and I think this may be enough as a talk. How do you practice? <coughs> How do I practice? I simply develop these thoughts all the time. I think, I think people should be happy. They should be peaceful. They should not have problems. They should not have difficulties. We, I like peace. I like peace. I like to see others in peace. I like to see people peaceful. I like to see people happy. I don't really, sincerely, I don't like to see people unhappy, miserable, in pain, in trouble, in fight, in quarrel. I don't like to see that. I wish, may I never see a fight. <clears throat> when I travel, I, I always think, may I never see fight among people, two people. I won't always want to see people talking in a very friendly way, uh, laughing, smiling. <clears throat> in a very simple language, I think. Uh, let me see all this when I travel. In 1993, when I was going to Europe, somebody told me, Bante, be very careful, there are a lot of uh, punks, punkies, you know, with uh, red hair, you know, <laughs> up and down on the... Uh, train station and so forth. They are very, mm, you know, unruly people. They might, um, you know, hurt you <coughs> because I look different. Actually, when I saw them, I traveled practically every European country uh, three and a half months in 1993. I saw them on train station, bus station, sometimes airports. As soon as I see them, I smile. They smile back. If I look, you know, show them my some sort of fear, they might take the advantage of it, just like um, animals. They might try to intimidate me. <clears throat> you know, when we smile at somebody, how can somebody show a very sh- a sour face? It is not all normally possible. They at least out of politeness, they will smile back. So this is our attitude <coughs> when we when we not out of um, hypocrisy, but honestly, sincerely must come from our heart that uh, we like to see happy people. We like to see 
ఫ్రెండ్లీ పీస్ఫుల్ హ్యాపీ పీపుల్ దట్ వీ థింక్ ఎవ్రీ డే దట్ ఈస్ అవి హ్యాపీ Okay, we um, have some meditation now. Sadhana. Sadhana.